All life is interrelated, woven of the water, of the earth, and of the air. We must listen to the story of Mother Earth, told gently to her children. We must listen and cooperate as one people to survive, for we live in exceptional times. Scientists tell us that we have 10 years to change the way we live, um, avert the depletion of natural resources and the catastrophic evolution of the Earth's climate. Artists can play an integral role in the raising of the public consciousness through advocacy. Art can be used to communicate complex ecological and scientific principles to an audience outside the confines of the academy. Um, of the academy um, or science museum. Oceans in Distress, uh, Documents 3. After this. My manual, my manual, my clicker is off. Uh, three drivers, main drivers, are sickening the global marine environment, and all are direct consequence of human activity. Global warming, acidification, and dwindling level oxygen, a, con a, a condition known as hypoxia. Pollution and global warming are pushing the world's oceans to the brink of mass extinction of marine life unseen for tens of millions of years. These symptoms, moreover, could be the harbinger of wider disruptions in the interlocking web of biological and chemical interactions that scientists now call Earth system. Oceans in Distress is a collaborative work that showcases the science um, and behind the issues of chemical, biological, acoustic, and industrial change uh, that is affecting the world's oceans and in turns ourselves. Eyes on the Earth. Scientists have joined hands with co-creative and technical uh, disciplines to see the Earth clearly. Um, Eyes on the Earth is a collaboration between NASA, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and the California Institute of Technology to look at atmosphere, the oceans, and the land. What has been measured shows the Earth unbalanced. A century of warming. The ozone hole, let me just do this. Uh, the ozone hole uh, has increased to 10.4 million square miles. Uh, the global average temperature has increased 1.5 degrees since 1980. Carbon dioxide has increased to 3 to 91 parts per million. Arctic sea ice minimum has reduced 11.5% um, per decade. And sea level has risen 3.27 uh, millimeters since 1992. These devastating changes create a string of broken tropic cascades across land and sea. A carbon dioxide counter, um, global warming and temperature change and chemical change. As part of this, I interviewed a really brilliant scientist called Scott uh, C. Downey. He's at the uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. And um, um, he's come up with some amazing and rather frightening uh, statistics. Um, this particular graphic is showing the changes in temperature uh, sort of graphically portrayed. And all of this, of course, brings about uh, uh, changes to uh, freshwater cycling as well. There we go. What we do on land, agriculture, fossil fuel combustion, and pollution can have profound impact on the chemistry of the sea. Over the past two centuries, human activities have resulted in dramatic increases in the atmospheric carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. I'm going to skip the. Here's Scott Downey. Um, part of his research, you can see, is a, a, a lot of this, this talk is, is geared to the subject matter, that is mapping. So what I'm trying to do is to show you uh, the scientists who are actually on that new frontier and are developing ways of seeing what's been unseen to this, to this point in time. Um, so this is Scott Downey uh, uh, um, about to uh, do some, some research and measurements.
So over the past two centuries, human activities have resulted in dramatic increases in atmospheric carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. There's a broad scientific consensus that these excess greenhouse gases are altering our planet's climate and acidifying the ocean. Growing evidence suggests that these uh, human-driven um, uh, climate changes and acidifications will impact other uh, uh, ocean ecosystems. Further pressure and put lim uh, um, will be put on living marine resources such as fisheries and the, and the coral reefs. Over uh, half, of, uh, half of human carbon dioxide emissions to the atmosphere absorbed by the ocean and the land, biospheres, and the excess carbon absorbed by the, um, by the ocean results in increased acidity. Um, carbon dioxide enters into the ocean, it combines with water, it forms carbon, uh, carbonic acid and serves as an acid-based product resulting in lowering of pH values. Um, surface uh, water pH values have already dropped by about a 0 0.1 pH units uh, from pre-industrial levels and are expected to drop an additional 0.14-0.35 uh, units by the end of the 21st century. And this is uh, what we can expect, and it's already happening, I'm sorry to say. Uh, the corrosive uh, corrosion affects the, um, not only the shellfish, but also the, uh, uh, the plankton layer of, of the ocean, which is the critical life form um, of the ocean that feeds all life as well as um, acts as a carbon sink within, within the ocean. This is, uh, this is actually fairly interesting because what it's showing is this, this is satellite data showing the plankton um, as the, um, um, and, and then sort of details of the skeletal details of the, of the plankton below. And what is interesting is that a plankton as a mass species um, can, can actually alter the chemistry of the sea um, by uh, when they're exposed to the ozone layer in very brilliant sunshine what they are actually able to do is they have a chemical reaction that uh, mixes with the water from their shells, that dissolves with their shells. It is then uh, uh, released into the atmosphere as a dust, which is like a sponge. It, it captures the moisture. They create their own cloud system. They create their own weather. Um, now, one of the issues here is that with this acidification that you will not, uh, there's a possibility, a strong possibility that if you lose the shell structure of, of the plankton, you know, you won't have that sort of moderating influence you see with climate, which they're currently doing naturally. And what you should also know, which I found out through one of the scientists at Woods Hole, is that coral are also trying to survive. Um, you, you've heard about the, the warming of the seas, you've heard about coral bleaching. What coral can actually do is there, there are living organisms within the shell-like structure and uh, some are more temperature sensitive than others. What happens is the ones that when you have coral bleaching, they start dying back. Um, the more tolerant to heat um, 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 animal, um, what happens is it has only a short span of time, but as this dies, they can actually recolonize the coral to save it. And they're now doing some, some work in Japan where they're attempting to continue. They're transplanting some of the, the hardier um, uh, more heat uh, tolerant uh, coral types uh, um, into their reefs because the uh, we'll go back to the plankton. Plankton is of the sunshine, so you can see that it's it's of the um, uh, the sun filtered water. Uh, climate change and ocean, ocean acidification will exasperate, exasperate other human influences on the fisheries and the marine ecosystems such as overfishing, habitat destruction, pollution, excess nutrients, and invasive species. Acidification harms the shell-forming plants and animals including the surface deep water corals. Many planktons, um, pteropods, which are marine snails, uh, are also affected mollusks, clams, oysters, and lobsters. Many of these organisms provide critical habitat um, and or food sources for other organisms. Emerging evidence uh, suggests that larval and juvenile fish are also su uh, susceptible to the pH changes. So marine life has survived uh, large climate and acidification variations in the past, um, uh, but the projected rates of climate change and ocean acidification over the last century are much faster 
uh, than experienced by the plant in the past, except for rare catastrophic events in the geological world. Um, filter feeding fish as the Atlantic menhaden and the herring family provide an ecological service for the oceans. Historically, the uh, herring family of fish migrated in monolithic schools from the Gulf of Mexico to Maine. Schools spanned a mile across. As they swam, they filtered phytoplankton from the water and reduced the growth of algae, clarifying the water and purging suspended uh, detritus from the coastal waters. They were, menhaden are the gill rakers of the ocean. They're literally the vacuums and um, uh, provide also the uh, sort of the food fish for a whole host of, of species as shown in this uh, bird's nest, if you like, of uh, a tropic cascade. You notice that man, for some reason, is number 81 at the top and uh, number one is detritus, number two is the phytoplankton. Um, so you see the base of life here for the oceans. And uh, this is the impact of the overfishing. Uh, where they literally are vacuuming out, and without that vacuum of the uh, of these gill rakers, um, you have a lot of this is the Gulf of Mexico, and you can see the wash down from the Mississippi River here, and um, uh, without the filter feeders, you lose that sort of natural cleansing mechanism, um, and that's that's an issue today. Now, some of the issues of uh, oceans in distress is that of the industrialization of the sea. You have very large tankers, you have pleasure boats, you have fishing boats, and they have the impacts on these very large mammals that swim um, close or near to the surface. Now, as part of the mapping process for this, uh, we look at the habitat. If you, if, if you look at NOAA, if you look at sort of the protective mechanisms that have to be put in place for endangered species, for the large, almost extinct marine whales, um, they try to determine locations by looking at their habitat species. So this is showing the sand lance, it's also showing the herring populations with an overlay, uh, overlay of the black dots of the uh, uh, critically endangered uh, North Atlantic right whale. And you notice on the uh, side of the screen with the boat uh, that they're actually doing the measurements um, of that, trying to um, trying to uh, figure out what is where. So what you're looking at here are acoustic recording tags that are put on with a 45-foot pole, 45-foot uh, uh, fiberglass, I guess, pole um, with this uh, suction cup-like disc that's put on. It's a, it's a recording tag onto the back of the humpback. Now, by doing that, what they're able to do is actually create a, um, a model of movement of the whale through the water to determine feeding, feeding behavior. And they've learned a great deal, for example, of the humpback whale. A humpback whale, they didn't know this, but what it does is it dives straight down to the bottom and uh, in one vertical dive, its lungs collapse. And what it does is it sort of scrapes along the bottom to feed. Um, so this is a three-dimensional visual, uh, visualization of, of that that was developed through a really brilliant man that I'm interviewing in December named Colin Ware. Colin Ware is, is at uh, the Data Visualization Research Lab um, at the Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping at the University of New Hampshire. Um, he's done some amazing work at trying to uh, communicate what's happening. And this shows you the tracks that are, are created when you, you have the, uh, the monitoring device um, on the whale. These are called track plots. And it's uh, where you see the vertical projections that look like little spines. That's showing uh, sort of the movement of the whale. As you can see down below, uh, the body orientation during side rolls. What they do is they scrape along the bottom to, to, uh, uh, to feed on the sand lance. This is the, uh, the habitat area of the, of the, the whales of all types, um, fin, humpback, mink, um, baleen, and others. Now this is showing you, in terms of conflicts, um, the, uh, this is showing the boat traffic that you have. Um, uh, it's a commercial trade. Um, it's very large commercial boats to fishing boats to pleasure boats to whale watching boats. Um, this is charting it out through Stellwagen Bank, which is sort of a critical uh, resource area. It's a natural, national marine sanctuary off the coast of New England. And it's a, a critical uh, feeding ground, actually, for a lot of uh, for the whales. And I'll show you what, what um, 
is what's being resolved here. What they did is they, they, they dis discovered that in red, the um, North Atlantic right whale was sort of clustered in a certain area where you had a lot of the, the sand lance and the herring. And the boats originally, uh, the large shipping traffic, had been going straight through the center of that. So what they've done is they've reoriented the shipping lines. Um, uh, politically, um, it was possible to do, and commercially, it was possible to do, and they, they did it, which is quite amazing. And I think that this sort of communication certainly helps to um, make the case and to actually show that it's, it's not going to cost that much more. Um, I think it's just dollars per, per, per mile of trip uh, to, to actually save these whales. And if you looked at it, there's a three-dimensional representation of large commercial vessel traffic. Um, there were 156 sh ships crossing the Stellwagen Bank. And you can see on the other side um, the original, um, the original uh, course came directly through. You can see the major feeding ground of, of these um, endangered uh, North Atlantic right whales. So by shifting it up through, through the center of those mountains of, of, uh, of diagram there, you can actually save uh, a numbers of, of the whales from, uh, from endangerment. Okay, and then this is some very interesting work that's being done in conjunction with Cornell Laboratory. Is the listening devices are being uh, are being placed on the ocean, and uh, that are able to monitor. And I wish that I, I, I had this uh, with the video. Um, what you see in in these sort of star-like dots, those are the calls of the North Atlantic right whale. And what they do is their their communication is only 10 miles through the water. Humpback is 100 miles. Uh, the great blue whales are thousands of miles. So in this instance, what happens is when you have large ship traffic come through, it drowns out their calls. They can't be heard. They start to shout. They literally raise, their, their, raise the tone of their, of their call, and, um, and in the, or they leave the area. Let's see if I can get this to work. No. Um, so it's, it's a real impact. Uh, so you know, what I'd like to do is acknowledge um, some of the scientists who who've, I've been uh, talking to, such as uh, uh, Scott Downey and uh, Colin Ware and the, uh, the scientists at the, uh, at the um, Stellwagen Bank Sanctuary, and uh, also the scientists at, uh, some of the other scientists at Woods Hole have been very supportive and very creative at trying to solve difficult problems, both politically and ecologically, I think, in a, in a very creative way. So thank you very much. Thank you.